Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, church today on this nice Sunday after Pentecost. It's uh, wonderful to be back as one church again uh, and uh, certainly see a few more people in the sanctuary, even though we're still kind of spread out a little bit. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Um, Let's see, where do I start today? <laughs> uh, I did um, have some conversations with a few people and said, uh, I think a couple weeks ago we had made a remark about Chuck Evans having some issues with the bow blockage and some adjustments with his pig maker. He is home. He's living with his daughter, Linda, and um, will probably be selling his home so, uh, and be moving in with her permanently. So as soon as we get that uh, added address, we will... Uh, forward that in the, in the newsletter and such. Uh, we will probably be taking the mini off of the bridge now that uh, things are getting back to a little bit more of normal. Uh, so I would encourage everyone and the different groups as you start making plans for how to get back together uh, with, the, uh, with the, some of the restrictions starting to ease a little bit. Uh, if you have the information, please get them in to us every month by about the 20th of the month so that we can include those in the bridge and make sure that we can get as much information out to everyone as we can about uh, our ongoing activities at church. Uh, also, uh, this tomorrow, uh, we'll be sending, council will be sending out a, a letter to the congregation through an email blast and then as we send out our paper bulletins later in the week to everyone else. Uh, regarding our marriage guidelines and how we are trying to expand those to be more inclusive and welcoming uh, to all uh, in our community. So please read those over when you get them. Uh, you can, if you have concerns, please call me. Uh, I'm more than willing to listen to any concerns that you might have about those. Uh, but we are trying to be more inclusive and welcoming, which is part of our actual mission statement of our congregation. With that in mind, we'll also have two uh, virtual town meetings uh, over the next couple weeks. One will be next Sunday afternoon. Not sure of the exact time yet, so uh, please stay tuned for that. Uh, but I will include that with the letter tomorrow uh, with the link to, uh, to this, how to get, log on to Zoom as well as uh, to get part of that meeting. If you don't have a computer and you can't get onto Zoom that way, there is a way to just simply call in on your phone uh, and get into the meeting as well. Or you can, again, call me at any time to, to express those concern, any concerns that you might have uh, regarding that letter. And then the fall, not, next Sunday we'll have that meeting, and then we'll also have a second one for anyone who can't make it on that Sunday the following Wednesday evening. So uh, please feel free. We want to hear from you if you have uh, concerns or uh, comments to make about our new wedding policy here at St. Paul's, and we'll go forward uh, after we get that letter out to you tomorrow. Uh, with that in mind, uh, again, welcome everyone to worship. Uh, we have made some tweaks to the sound system, which uh, hopefully for all those who are listening online, you'll be able to uh, hopefully hear everything a little better. Uh, I think it's a little even better inside here, uh, inside the sanctuary itself, but it certainly will be better, I think, for anyone who is going to continue to live stream with our worship. And with that in mind, we'll uh, invite Wanda forward for our prelude and uh, prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
And if you'll please rise for the confession and forgiveness. We began our worship this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. And I invite you to kneel as you are able. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll sing our gathering hymn, All Who Hunger Gather Gladly.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And let us pray. Glorious God, your generosity waters the world with goodness, and you cover creation with abundance. Awaken in us a hunger for the food that satisfies both body and spirit. And within this food, fill all the starving world. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. The first reading comes to us this morning from Isaiah, the 55th chapter. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money... Come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you might live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. The word of the Lord. The second lesson comes to us this morning from Romans, the ninth chapter. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them according to the flesh comes the Messiah, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to Matthew, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, when Jesus heard about the beheading of John the Baptist, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. 
Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed them and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Charles uh, Swindell tells a funny story about a a nine-year-old little boy named Danny. He came bursting forth from his Sunday school room one Sunday, and he came out of that room like a wild stallion, and, and his eyes were darting around trying to find his mom and dad. And when he finally found his dad, he, he wrapped his arms around his dad's leg and said, Dad, we had a, a great story in the, in the Sunday school today. It was about the, about the Israelites escaping from Egypt. And they, and they got out of Egypt, and they ran as fast as they could to the Red Sea. And the, and the Egyptian army, well, it was closing in on them, getting closer and closer. So Moses got on his walkie-talkie, and he called to the Israeli Air Force, and the Air Force came and bombed all the Egyptian army. And of course, while the Egyptian army was doing that, the Egyptian, or the, I should say the Israeli army was bombing the Egyptians, the Israeli Navy was building a pontoon bridge across the Red Sea, and all the people got out, and they made it. Well, his dad was a a bit shocked by that story, and he said, is that really the way they taught you that story in Sunday school? Well, not really, Danny said. But if you told it the way they told it to us in Sunday school, you'd never believe it. With that childlike innocence, that little guy put his finger on the pulse of a sophisticated adult world where cool skepticism reigns supreme. It's more popular today to operate in a black and white world and, of course, to leave no space for miracles, no space for change. And so we read the story of the feeding of the 5,000 this morning. And we tend to focus on the question, did this really happen? I mean, there have been a number of attempts to explain this miracle over the years. One attempt says that the people were so moved by Jesus' generosity and the generosity of this young boy that they pulled out food from their clothes and and their travel pouches. And this way, everybody was satisfied. Another theory says that the story really isn't about a physical hunger, but a spiritual hunger. And that as the disciples were passing around the five loaves and the two fish, everybody took a a minuscule pinch from it, a, a symbolic fragment to illustrate being fed spiritually. In this, Jesus is said to have satisfied the soul, the spiritual side of ourselves, and not the stomach. You know, I think these questions really say a lot more about us than they do about God. If Jesus is the Messiah, and I believe that he is, then there is no question, but he performed miracles. And he did so quite regularly. The point of this story of the feeding of the 5,000 is not to prove that miracles happen. The point of this story is to teach us, I think, three things. First, it teaches us that Jesus is the fulfillment, the fulfillment of the Word of God. How long had the Israelites waited for the Messiah? It had been centuries, I mean, I think four centuries to be exact, since the last prophet had spoken in the land. Malachi called this backsliding nation to repentance 400 years before Christ came. And it had been longer still since Israel and Judah 
had had somebody like King David or Solomon or Moses to lead them. And the scriptures were alive in the life of the Jewish people. As children, they knew these stories by heart, these stories of their ancestors and being told that one day the Messiah would come and he would fulfill all the hopes and the promises of all those years of waiting. The hunger of this group of 5,000 men gathered to hear Jesus teach, who following this man from Nazareth are all asking the same questions. Is this the one? It is true that there were many reasons for coming to hear Jesus that day, probably as, as many as there were people in the crowd. But they were all asking this one central question. Is he the Messiah or a prophet? Elijah, the, the heir of Elijah's ministry during the time of King David, once fed a hundred men with 20 loaves of barley, or 20 barley loaves. In that story, a, a sermon came in a time of famine with 20 loaves of bar barley and, and fresh ears of grain and a sack offering for Elijah. Suddenly, Elijah turns to that servant and says, Go and give it to the men. Let them eat. But the servant said, How can I serve this many people with just 20 loaves of bread? Sounds familiar, doesn't it? We have nothing here. We have just five loaves of bread and two fish. But what are they among so many? I mean, we are a small church in a, in a changing neighborhood. We're an elderly congregation, and the world keeps changing around us. But Elijah says, give it to the people to eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left over. The Messiah would come in the spirit of the prophets of old. And that's what the people have been told. And, and Jesus one day asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? And of course their answer was, well, some say Elijah or one of the other prophets. And so Jesus stood there on that hillside in the shadows of all that history and feeds not a hundred people with 20 loaves of bread, but 5,000 men plus all their families with five loaves of bread and two fish. It was clear to all that this man was fulfilling the word of God that this was indeed God's messenger. You know, it's remarkable to me how much the past is tied to the present and how much the future depends upon that connection. We see it in the life of our Lord. Jesus reveals who he is and teaches who God is by repeating the acts out of the stories and lessons of the Old Testament of the prophets of old. Jesus steps into their lives and brings the past, the Old Testament past, to life. He breathes new life into it again. In a word, he is the fulfillment of God's word. There is great theology, yes, but don't miss the other message that he teaches that we didn't read in our gospel lesson today. It's interesting to note that the end of this story, all were satisfied. Jesus feeds the, the multitude out of compassion, but there is no final teaching at the end of this story. Matthew simply tells us all were satisfied. So first of all, this passage teaches us who Jesus is, that he is the fulfillment of God's word. And secondly, it teaches us that we are to serve at the table of our Lord. 
as the sun began to wane and, and the end of the day grew near. The people had listened for hours. As many as 20,000 people. Remember, it wasn't just the men that were counted, but, but the women and children, their families as well. A stadium full, sitting there in a valley. And they were listening and trying to answer that question, who is this? And it was now time for dinner. And the disciples, perhaps out of care for their master, or maybe because they were just hungry themselves, urged Jesus to send the crowd away so that they could get food for themselves. But Jesus surprised these disciples. He instead told them, you give them something to eat. Now I'll tell you, there are many occasions where I think we would say the exact same things as the disciples. Really, Jesus? All we have here are five loaves of bread and two fish among this entire crowd. What are they? But Jesus offered the 12 opportunities to see God at work. They see something other than the world that they had come to know and understand. He asked them for the food, and Jesus blessed it and broke it. And then he gave it to them and told them to go and give it to the crowd. You know, these past six months, we've seen many people serving us and serving all of this country. We have seen them serve from New York to Ohio to California. And many of them have sacrificed their lives. We can name some of those heroes. And not the least of them are our police and firefighters, our doctors and nurses. I wonder how many of them understand the miracle that is happening. That God is at work beneath their feet. That God is at work as they hold the hand of somebody who's dying in a hospital or a nursing home because their families can't get in there because of the virus. I wonder how many of them understand that God is multiplying their efforts because he cares. It's the nature of God's kingdom to care and to do miracles. That's what the disciples were learning that day. That they are content, that they were content to send these people home. But God is at work, that his work isn't done. And as they hand out the bread, they participated in something that was much larger than they were capable of understanding. Thousands were suddenly fed with food that did not exist an instant before God's unfolding blessing by the Messiah drew them into being and called these disciples to serve. So God is at work fulfilling his word. And second, God is calling us to respond to that word by serving. And finally, we are given the ability to use what we bring to that table. In 1872, Booker T. Washington decided that he wanted to go to school. And so he traveled 500 miles to uh, Hampton Institute in Virginia. And when he got there, he presented himself to the head uh, teacher. Now, Washington recalled later that he had been walking for days, weeks, without proper food, a bath, a, a change of clothing. And he said he probably didn't make the most favorable impression upon this teacher. And that, I, and that he could see that there were doubts in her eyes. Finally, she said to him, the adjoining recitation room is in need of cleaning. Here's a broom. 
Now, many other people would have been insulted by being assigned such a menial task when they were asking to come to that school. But not Washington. He recognized it as an incredible opportunity, that this was his big chance. And so he swept that room three times, and he dusted it four other times. He even cleaned the walls and the closets. And then he reported back to the the head teacher that the job was finished. And she came in and she examined the room like a drill sergeant. She even pulled out a handkerchief and, and wiped it across the top of the door. When she could not find a particle of dust, she said to Washington, I guess you will do to enter this institution. As a 16-year-old, Washington did not do many things, but he could clean a room, and he did it gloriously. Extraordinary living, extraordinary living begins with ordinary gifts. What gifts and graces do you have that you have not fully activated or used? What table is the Lord calling you to serve at? I hope that you'll ponder those questions this week. Amen.
confident in your care, helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. You take resources that appear to be meager, bless them, and there is enough. May your church trust that what you bless and ask us to share with the world is abundantly sufficient. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your bountiful creation offers sustenance and life for all creatures. Protect this abundance for the well-being of all. Reverse the damage we have caused your creation. Replenish groundwater supplies, provide needed rain in places of drought, and protect forests from wildfires. And Lord, we remember all those on the East Coast this week that will be affected by the hurricane. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You offer yourself to all the nations and peoples of the earth, inviting everyone to abundant life. Bring your prophetic vision to fullness, that all nations will run to you and that nations will not know or will <clears throat> the nations who do not know you will find their joy in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You open your hand and satisfy the de desire of every living thing. Hear the anguish of tender hearts who cry to you in suffering and satisfy their deepest needs. Bring wholeness and healing to those who suffer in body, heart, soul, and mind. We especially remember Chris Collard, Chuck Evans, Josh Keller, Bob Coughlin, Dr. Donald Zimmerman, Nancy Strawn, Martha Scott, Mary Ann, Nikki, Sue, Judy Hall, Don and Wanda Evans, Catherine Richards, Bob Kiefer, Linda Klein, Sarah Hughes, Chrissy Sturtz, Donna Viles, Betty Ayers, Phyllis Dara, Jean Dexter, Janet Duke, Betty George, Marjorie Hill, Bob Kirsch, Dan Landing, Anna Langenfeld, Daniel Leone, Darlene Lewis, Angela Sutter, Amy White, Maria Lichtenberger, Diane Brandt, Karen Lundquist, Dave Paul, Ron Mimer, Jim Mullen, Hazel Draper, Jennifer Mays, Alice Ferguson, and Cheryl Shaw. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You offer freely the fullness of salvation Give our congregation such a welcoming heart that our words and actions may extend your free and abundant hospitality to all whom we encounter. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You gather your saints as one, united in the body of Jesus. Bring us with all your saints to the heavenly banquet. We remember with love and thanksgiving all the saints we have known in our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And again, from a distance, uh, please offer that peace to one another. Uh, again, uh, our offering plates are at both the entrance of the doors, and if you're watching from home, uh, you can again give electronically or put your offerings in the mail, and they'll eventually get here to the church. We'll continue with our anthem.
And if you'll please locate your kind of pre-filled communion kits that are located in your pews. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy God, our maker and redeemer and healer, in the harmonious world of your creation, the plants and animals, the seas and stars were whole and well in your praise. When sin had scarred the world, you sent your son to heal our ills and to form us again into one. If you'll please uh, remove the top of the kit to receive the bread. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took a cup. He gave thanks and gave it to all the drinks, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. And he said, do this as often as you gather in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his acts of healing, his body given up, and his victory over death, we await that day when all the peoples of the earth will come to the river to enjoy the tree of life. Send your spirit upon us and upon this meal. As grains scattered on the hillside become one bread, so let your church be gathered from the ends of the earth, that all may be fed with the bread of life, your Son. Through him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. And make us bold, O merciful God, to address you as Abba as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We'll sing our sending hymn, Let Us Talents and Tongues Employ.
And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Live in love as Christ loved us. Thanks be to God.